Why did Jesus leave heaven and come to earth? Big question, isn't it? Why did Jesus enter time and space? Very important question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the answer is so that you and I can have fellowship, a relationship with the creator of the universe. Boy, that's big, isn't it? To think that folks like you and me, just run-of-the-mill kind of folks, can have a relationship with the creator of this whole universe. That's why Jesus left heaven. And the purpose of the Bible, the purpose of everything that's happened from Genesis to Revelation is that we might have fellowship with him. By the way, you know, it's possible because you and I were created in the image of God. What does that mean? Say, I'm created in the image of God. It means a lot of things, but I think it primarily means we have the ability to choose. That's unique among everything that's alive. You cannot name anything that's alive in this whole world that their the whole life is not more or less pre-programmed. In other words, you take any animal in their habitat of where that animal is, their life is pre-programmed. It's impossible for anything else alive to have a relationship with God except human beings can have that relationship. We've made his image because we can choose. Our lives are not pre-programmed. We can decide to live our whole life away from God, running from God, calling our own shots, and walk around in darkness. And John says, if you walk around in darkness, you're going to stumble. Oh, I'm glad he told us that. <laughs> We've already discovered that, haven't we? And therefore, we have this wonderful verse in 1 John Chapter 1, verse 7, if, that's a big if, we walk in the light as he, Jesus Christ, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another who are in the light, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, keeps on cleansing you and cleansing me of all sin. And we'll deal with this more exhaustively later on in our study about the blood of Christ. Now, you got it? So, to put it another way, Jesus came to this world so you and I will be able to walk in the light. That's not L-I-T-E, it's L-I-G-H-T for some of you. We're able to walk in the light. In other words, so we can be light walkers. Now, the question, are you a light walkers? Do you walk in the light? Is your life lived primarily in the light of God? That's the question. Now, you say, well, I'm not sure. I, I want to be. I think I am. This is how we know for sure. The Scripture tells us. You are a light walker. I am a light walker when we know who Jesus is. When we know who Jesus is. Verse 1 tells us who Jesus is. Don't miss it. My little children. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. By the way, let's stop right there. Does that make any sense? You ever just read about, you don't stop. There. What is that? He said, I'm writing to this so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have so many words, forgiveness. I'm writing to you so that you may not sin. But if we sin, you already have forgiveness. Does that help keep you from sin? Have you ever gone out and said, you know, I'm going to do this, and I know it's wrong, but God is going to forgive me after I do it. I know nobody thinks like that but me. <laughs> or you say, you know, I'm not going to do this, though I know God wants me to do it, but I know when I do not do this thing, God is going to forgive me for not doing it, not being obedient. You think like that sometimes? You see, we use verses like this so we can live promiscuous lives, so we can have an out in anything and say, oh, he loves me so much, doesn't matter what I'm doing. But he says he's writing this to keep us from sinning. But if we sin, the verses say we're forgiven. 
if we are light walkers. Now, how does that work? Barnhouse tells a story of talking with a man who lived a decadent life, a godless life, immoral life, in every area of living. But as he bottomed out in darkness, someone introduced him to Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. And Jesus Christ lighted up the life of this decadent, immoral man. And he got in the church. And he met a wonderful gal in the church, a wonderful lady in the church, and they fell in love. And then he went to Barnhouse and said, I've got a problem. I'm going to her and tell her about my past life. So he went to her and told the story. He said, I was immoral. I was decadent. And this godly woman said to this soon-to-be her husband, I want you to know something. I know you're totally converted. I know you're a Christian. And I know God has given you a new life. But she said, I also know the pull of the flesh. And she said, I hope it never happens, but if you go back into sin, don't let the devil tell you, well, your life is done for, you're a hypocrite. She said, I want you to know I forgive you in advance. And I'm your wife, and you come home, and I'll love you and forgive you totally and completely, no matter what you do. I love you that much. What that man said? He said, I dropped my head and I cried and I said, oh, God, how could anybody not stay clean before someone who loves him like that? Now, you see, folks, that's what this scripture is saying. This great love that God has for us as members of his family, he does not want us to sin. But when we do, he forgives us in advance, knowing that keeps us from sinning. It keeps us from sinning. And then he goes on and tells us who Jesus is, the rest of the verse. Look at it. He says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have an advocate. The word advocate means literally paraclete. It means a helper. It means we use it in the sense of an attorney, but it's more than that. It's somebody whom you have given authority to. It is some somebody you have given them your proxy you have given them the legal rights to you and so we have an advocate and when we give our hearts to Christ he becomes our official proxy and he represents us and that's important we have an advocate we have somebody who represents us then it goes on the verse see the word righteous see the word righteous it said he is righteous Jesus was righteous as divine he entered history as righteous as the Son of God, he lived a righteous life. He came into this world with a righteous life, and we have him. He is righteous. Therefore, not only do we have somebody pleading our case and stating our case, that person doing it is a righteous person. Therefore, when God looks at Edwin Young, he doesn't see me. He sees Jesus, who is righteous. He is not only my advocate, he is righteous. And I have given him my old life. He's given me his new life. He represents me. So in this sense, as we see in the next verse, this, this is who Jesus is. And we see in a minute what Jesus has done, what we trust that he has done, what we trust what Jesus did. We have an advocate, and he is righteous. Powerful. Look at the next thing. Now we look, if we're light walkers, we look what Jesus did Look what he did at verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation, as a good word, for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Propitiation. It means he is our substitute. It means he died for us. He took all the garbage upon himself. He is our propitiation. By the way, it's a tremendous psalm I love here. Turn quickly, if you would, to the book of Psalms. Middle of your Bible, middle of your Bible. Look at Psalm chapter number 85, verse number 10. It says, loving kindness, a blood covenant word, and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. I love that phrase. This is what happened on the cross. This is how Jesus is our propitiation. You see, he comes and takes all of our garbage upon him, and he pays the penalty that you and I deserve 
propitiation takes place. He is our substitute so we may be set free. So who is Jesus? He is an advocate. He is righteous. And what did Jesus, if we walk in the light, we're to know what he did, and he is our propitiation. He made it right with the Father. And he's an advocate not only for us on the cross, but also he's an advocate now at the right hand of the Father, isn't he? Now and forever. And the third thing we see about light walkers, light walkers are obedient to the commands of Jesus. That's the next verse. Go back to 1 John if you have found Psalms yet. Uh, go back to 1 John, verse number 3. For by this we know. And by the way, I want you to look at all the we know and you knows in here. You know, everybody on TV now, and you find yourself doing it, you know, you know, you know, we know, we know, you, you know, we scored that touchdown, we know, and, and you know that, that the president went over here, and you know, and we know, we got that, you know, you can't even listen, you know, to anything, most speak, it's got a million you knows, and we sort of criticize that, it's redundant, except you read First John, he's saying the same thing, look at this chapter, look at all the you know and we knows, I mean, you just, I've got them underlined, I won't read them all to you, look at verse 3, we know, middle of verse 3, uh, uh, have come to know, look at verse 4, have come to know him. Uh, look at uh, verse 5, but we, what we know. Uh, look down at verse, oh gosh, uh, verse 13, you know him. Uh, look at the latter part of 13, you know. Uh, all the way through, look at 14, you know. All the way through, you know, you know. wonder why. Remember the theme of the book? Remember we don't? It is written so that we will know. We'll have confidence. We'll have blessed assurance. So he's saying, you know, you know, you know. He's driving it, driving it, driving it in us. And he says, if you walk in the light, you are obedient to the commands of Jesus. What are the commands of Jesus? Well, he talks about it. Let me elaborate that a little bit more. He says, we have come to know, you know him, if we keep his commandments, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So those who walk in the light, who are light walkers, they are obedient. They're obedient to the commands. You see this all the way through the Bible. You see that all the way through life. Now understand something. Sometimes to obey God and walk his will, the first steps are very painful. That's right. To do right, many times, is very painful. But in the long run, in the long walk, it is very blessed. Pain, blessing. The other way around, sometimes to do wrong is very happy and very seems to be blessed, but in the long run, it is very, very painful. So we're to be obedient. You think it's easy to be obedient? Is, is it obe easy to be obedient to the precepts and to follow in the steps of Jesus Christ and to walk with him? Look, look in the Old Testament. Was it easy for Noah when God said to him, Noah, I want you to go build a big luxury liner in the middle of Nevada. And Noah must have said, would you say that again? God, how am I going to get the boat to the ocean if I build it in Nevada? And God says, I'll take care of the details. So Noah starts to build this boat. His wife said, Noah's lost it. Pew. His children said, man, the old man has become a religious nut. All of his friends said, don't have anything to do with Noah. Man, he's building this big boat out in the middle of the desert. What a, what a loon. What a, what a waste of time and energy. And they all just read Noah off because he was obedient until it started to rain. Hmm. He was obedient. What about Moses? You know, Moses comes back after being in hiding for committing a murder. He comes back to Egypt and God says, Moses, yes, Lord, I met you in the burning bush. I got you. I got the message. He said, Moses, I want you to take almost two million people who've lived in slavery for many, many generations. They have built the pyramids. They have worked all over Egypt. They've been the labor force in Egypt. 
for all these generations, and I want you to go to them and say, okay, let's just leave and all go to a beautiful land of promise that God has provided for us. Okay, gang, let's go. And Moses said, you want me to do what? I want you to bring them all out. Moses said, do you think Pharaoh, who has the most powerful army in the world, is going to sit back and say, well, y'all take plenty to eat with you. We sure are going to miss you. He said, no, that army is going to come and get, you, get me. What do you mean, Lord? And the Lord said, Moses, I just want you to obey. I'll take care of the details. Now, this is the way it is with obedience in all of our lives so many, many times. And by the way, you've got a cute little verse here. One commentator introduced me. Look at Hebrews. Turn left, not far. Chapter number 11, talking about the roll call of faith, those who are obedient. And I want to show you what happens when we obey. This is what happened to all the men and women of faith through the ages. Look at verse 2 of Hebrews 11. For by it the men of old, look at that phrase, gained approval. Gained approval. And look at verse 39. It's repeated. And all these having gained approval through their faith. In other words, they had faith, they obeyed, gained approval. What does that mean? It means when Moses and Noah and Abraham and Bill and Mary and Alice and Joe and Robert and when we obey and walk in the light as God is leading us, we gain approval. God simply says, that's a way to go. He gives applause. That's the only way, Moses, only way, Noah, only way we make it when we take tough steps of obedience it is the approval and the applause of God, and it comes when we obey. So, we are to walk in obedience. Also, the passage I read extensively here for our main scripture, it says we're to walk in love. And boy, that's a hard verse to understand. Listen again to verse 7. Now listen, see what this means to you. First, maybe it's the first time you read it. It says, Beloved, I am writing a new commandment to you. Okay. I'm writing a new commandment, John says. Then he says, But an old commandment which you have had from the beginning... Now, wait a minute, John. You're writing a new commandment, but you're talking about an old commandment you've had from the beginning? The old commandment is the word which you have heard. Now, wait a minute. How can I have a new commandment, okay, when I've already had an old commandment that we've heard the same thing from the beginning? Does that make a lick of sense logically to anybody? What's John saying? It does when we understand it. Remember in Mark 12 that when they came to Jesus and they were trying to trap him, and they said, oh, what, what is the great commandments? And Jesus quoted the old commandments. He reached back in Leviticus 19. He reached back in Deuteronomy 12, and he says, well, there are two of them. Love God with everything you got, heart, soul, mind, spirit. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. He's just quoting Deuteronomy and Leviticus. That commandment had been there with the Jews for hundreds and hundreds of years. But Jesus said the same thing. And John is saying, that's the old commandment of love. What did love mean in the Old Testament? It was limited love. <laughs> the Gentiles were in the Old Testament, meant for the fires of hell. By the way, a Gentile is anybody who's not a Jew. Biblical definition, anybody not a Jew, you're a Gentile. We, all Gentiles are meant for the fires of hell, says the Old Testament. The Old Testament says that women are very, very inferior. Old Testament. But there's still this same commandment of love. What is the new commandment? It's the old commandment that has caught fire in Jesus Christ because Jesus puts a whole new definition of love. Does he not? He says you are to love those who are not like you. Oh, how are you doing with that one? And more than that, the Jesus love, we are to love people that does not like us. Now there you get to be a five beta cap in love. How do you love somebody that just hates you, doesn't like you, doesn't trust you, slanders you? How do you like loving those people? But Jesus gives us the capacity to do it. That's being obedience. And most of us have a long way to go there. 
You see, so there's the old commandment, the same words, but here's the new commandment with Jesus because now he gives us the capacity as we're in Christ and Christ is in us because we see he demonstrated that kind of love in his earthly life and certainly in his death. He died for sorry stuff like you and me while we were still sorry. While we were yet sinners. So we are to walk in obedience. We are to walk in love. And that's what this is all about. And obedience is where you begin. You sometimes we obey because we have to, right? My mother told me to do something or not do something. We never voted in our family. I mean, I had to do it or I had not to do it, whatever it was. My mother spoke, bang, that's it. I had to do it or I had to stop doing it, whatever it was. She'd sometimes say, go find Edmund, whatever he's doing, tell him to stop it. I mean, that's the way it was. But, you know, I, I, I had to do it. And sometimes uh, we obey because we need to do it. I go to work. I don't like what I'm doing, but, hey, I need the paycheck, so I go to work. I need to do it. But it's wonderful when we obey because we love to do it. And that's what Christ gives us the capacity to love to do it. And that's a big, big, big thing. Now, I want to show you how to, <laughs> I call it um, walking in the light for dummies. This next section. Now, we, we, we want to be light walkers. I'm taking that as a given, as a thesis. All of us would like to walk in the light of God. And, and we know that the characteristic of a light walker, we've already seen, a light walker is someone who knows who Jesus is, and a light walker trusts what Jesus has done, and a light walker obeys what Jesus commanded. And he talked about walk in obedience and walk in love. But now, this is sort of a summary section that is really confusing. And I call it walking in light for dummies. Because John says... Three things, he's saying, this I am writing to you, this I am writing to you, this I am writing to. Now he repeats himself and says, this I have written to you, this I have written to you, this I have written to you. And he writes the same thing a second time. But now he tells us, in whatever category you're in, wherever you are in your Christian life, you have to understand where you are and walk in the light. He first of all talks to children. See it there? And generally he says, I am writing this to you, little children. And I believe there he means little children. Those who are taking have taken a few steps in the Christian life. A few steps. In other words, you're basically a brand new Christian. You've just now started to walk out of the darkness and get into the light. And you've taken a few steps. He said, little children, just understand that you have a new life that you've been born again, paraphrase the scripture, just understand you're beginning where you are. Don't get impatient. You've taken a few steps with Christ, that's super. That's not anything to do with age. It's just how you've taken a few steps with Christ. These little children, I am, I am writing this to you and I've written this to you. He said it twice. Line upon line, precept upon precept, so we'll get it. Then he goes, he said, all right, fathers, I am writing this to you. Then he says, I have written this to you. He said, fathers, in other words, he said, you know everything from the beginning. I believe what he's saying there. He's saying, those of you who've taken many steps in the light, as a Jesus follower, you've taken many steps in the light, you've been around for a while, you see the whole sweep of history. You understand something of the sovereignty of God, the providence of God, the cost of being disobedient, and the joy of being obedient. You are sort of understanding that. You've been around for a while. And fathers, you understand salvation history. Okay. He's learning categories. He's saying it twice. Line upon line, preach up, preach. Little children, you're taking a few steps. Fathers, you've taken a lot of steps in Christian life. Then he says young men, and he could have certainly said young women. It's implied. Young women, he said, now you're in the middle of walking with Christ. He said, you are strong, and you have defeated the evil one. 
this is a word of compliment and a word of praise for those who are walking in the light. That's their applause. That's their approval. Hey, gang, those of you just starting, you don't know it all, man, hang in there, those two steps. Those who have been walking the light a long time, man, I approve. Hang in there. Those who are in the middle of their life, they're in the light of Christ, man, that's super. You just keep on growing up in the faith. That's what these verses are saying. Now, one question, and I'm done. Do you know, do you know for sure that you are walking in the light?